good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for Solutions to Common Registration Problems. Chuck is your solution provider for today, and he has a full agenda, so we don't have time for small talk. Do remember to use that chat box to share questions and comments along the way. We are recording this session, and so you'll be able to return and review or share with a colleague who couldn't join today. So, Chuck, get us started. Very good. Well, thank you, Sharon, and again, welcome everyone to our uh, uh, basically, I guess last one of the fiscal year. Next month is conference time. We will not be having a monthly regular webinar. So uh, you're enjoying the last of fiscal year, what, 22. Um, so what are we about today? Well, the issue is if you got a problem, uh, what are some things that you run into with registrations? And I, as you can see from the agenda, lots of things going on. I, I need more info, multiple regis, transfers, billings, I want to be on a wait list, memberships, enrolling others, uh, encouraging other enrollments, uh, one payer, and again, grouping. So if you want grouping, stick around, we're going to cover it. Uh, student needing a refund or changing payment status. And then finally, the dreaded, ah, shucks, pending. Uh, and then finally, we're going to close with batches of registration, batches and batches and batches. So uh, strap on your seatbelt, uh, put on your helmet, let's get going. Data, data, never can have enough data. And you're in luck because Student Manager has lots of data fields for you in registration data. Uh, there are a number of fields on the main registration tab. Uh, reg code, miscellaneous code, uh, status t-shirt, which is one of the reg codes. Uh, in addition, you've got your uh, user defined fields, which can be defined uh, at the system level or as you'll learn at the class level or course level. And then finally, uh, unlimited user defined fields, which of course are available on names, courses, registrations. Uh, but again, if you're running out of data uh, in the other two main screens, uh, you can get more with additional uh, unlimited UDFs. Um, on the registration side, under the preferences, if you look at the registration tab, you'll see there are several fields there like uh, reg code that you can label uh, and use for a different purpose. Now, what you're going to note is those labels are permanent uh, or, or universal across all the users in your system. Um, however, uh, and then also same thing applies to user-defined registration fields, the four character, logical, etc. Uh, when you define them, they actually are not universally available to all because one of the options that you've got is on a course by course basis, you can actually go into the bottom part of the additional info tab on the course and label uh, data elements that would only appear on the registration form for, or the, these labels would appear on the Reg UDF form labels just for that class. So you might have the UDF set up here to be license number or uh, date graduated, but on the uh, course you're in, you could have, again, a different use for that particular UDF. Uh, so that meal preference on this particular course would only be shown on the registration UDF labels if you're registering for this particular course, uh, 21, actually not that one, the, the real course number. Uh, but on a different course, you could use it for t-shirt size. Again, this is a great uh, tool to be able to use, especially if you do conferences. One caveat I don't have a slide for, but if you have a registration bit of data that you do want to analyze, across every single registration in your system, then you would not want to use, you would not want to use the, that particular UDF, you wouldn't want to use it for a private UDF for conference X or Y or Z. 
So again, uh, you, you need to kind of decide among your users in the, in the group, you know, are there any master labels for UDFs that should never be changed at the course level and which, which course level labels you, you don't care about because you'll never do a mass analysis of that particular value uh, when you uh, get on um, the, uh, when you're doing system-wide analysis. Okay, uh, I still need more data, I'm, I'm running out. Well, there is where the additional UDFs, uh, unlimited additional UDFs come into play. Uh, where you can create um, as many as you want. You can create character, numeric, date, logical, or memo. You can create drop-down lists for them and use them on a web form. Uh, so again, uh, if you wanna see how that's in use, you could go to this example in the sandbox and see that. And Sharon, I'm gonna do a hands up right now to kind of make sure people are awake after that big lunch they had. Raise your hand if you are using uh, any of the unlimited UDFs. It could be on name, course, register. I just wanna know how many of you have actually created and used some unlimited, you know, the create your own from scratch UDFs. And You've got a couple, Chuck. Got a, a couple, couple there. Very good, very good. All right, we're, we're moving good. Uh, you'll note I will probably not do a lot of live examples during the first go through, uh, depending on how we do at the end of time, at the end of time, at the end of the session, uh, if you've got examples that you'd like to, I'd like to see a live example of X or Y, uh, we'll see if we can cover it. Okay, here's another challenge. I wanna put several registrations together. And again, why do you do that? Well, you might want to make one payment for all of the registrations uh, or print a receipt or a confirmation for all of these registrations, showing them all on one particular receipt. So what are the cases? Well, an individual might register in several courses and make a single payment. Now, that's probably the most common one that people who allow grouping would do. Second one is an individual wants to pay for somebody else. Again, spouse enrolling another spouse. A um, business uh, a colleague enrolling another colleague in a professional class. Parents enrolling multiple children in the summer camp. They, they like to just pay for the whole thing at one time. Uh, and then finally, several employees in a company have registered, but then after they've registered, maybe individually, the company says it wants to pay for all of those registrations in one check. So that's a little interesting widget. So grouping at time of registration. A couple of things, if you uh, use grouping, and again, this is from the student manager. Now this is from the staff side. When you do, if, if you do grouping at the staff side, I would encourage, from student manager, I would encourage you to go into preferences and turn on the prompt for grouping. Uh, and again, you'll note that's a black preference which means that uh, it's only valid for your user uh, profile. So different users in your organization can turn that on or off. Um, when that happens, once you enroll someone in a class and then are enrolling somebody else in the same class, or if you're enrolling yourself in uh, one student in multiple classes, it'll ask you for the second registration and subsequent ones do you want to group this registration with the previous one? And if so, it allows you to automatically do that without having to go in and do a manual after the fact, which is this model here. Uh, well, actually this shows you after you've done a group, uh, the show group button on the registration screen allows you to see what registrations are in the group. And this is an example where one student has enrolled in two classes, made it a group, and they've billed or will pay for it uh, you know, at one time. They can pay for both of them at one time. Removing a registration from a group. Uh, if you have a group and you say, well, I need to take somebody out of this group, you click on the group button, and then you have options of what you wanna do next. So you can um, remove this record from the uh, group, 
group it with another or selectively ungroup and move people around. So once you remove that record from the group, you are then able to do what, it's a single registration, it stands on its own. Here's that example of the firm who decided after individuals registered, they wanna group those registrations together. So it's the grouping after the train has left the station or after the fact. So what you can do then is um, go into a registration, click on the group button and ask if you want to link this registration with another group. Uh, so when you do that, it pops up a, a list of existing registrations. That list is shown in reverse chronological order. So in other words, the most recent registration added is at the top of the list. Now, if it's just you in the database, you're the only one working in student manager, the last registration you would have entered would have been on the top, but with multiple staff, if you've got several registration staff, uh, the last name you entered might have been two or three down the list because Susie next door and Bill over across the way or somebody on the web has enrolled in the class. So, but it is pretty much in reverse chronological order. So the most recent ones are gonna float to the top. Um, adding to an existing group. It's possible to group groups. So again, if you have a couple of people and maybe it's a company example again, a couple of people from Aceware and a couple other people from Aceware and well, uh, Sharon wants all those four people in one group, you can group one group with another uh, registration group. So again, same kind of thing applies, click the button, pop up the list of the registrations, select it, and then you would uh, bring those up. Now here's another lament here, is that if you're doing grouping, and especially if you have a large database, I'm looking up an existing registration to group and it just takes me forever, okay? So the point is, if you, uh, there is a way for you to scope the length of time in terms of how many days back the system goes to pull up registrations for you to group. And again, this is going to depend on your organization and how students and your operation works. But that if you say, well, typically we're only grouping people who have recently registered. So in your preferences area, you can click on the show groupings for X number of days and change that number to whatever. If it's two weeks, you could put 14 days. Uh, if it's three months, you put in 90 days. But the point is, if you've got, you know, 10 years worth of registration data and you're really not you're grouping anybody who's over X number of days old, you can change that grouping number to um, basically shorten the query in pulling up that list. Now, when you, if, as you notice, it, when you click on grouping and you, you present the list of people who are, who you want to group, there is a, that number of the default number of days to go backwards. And if, if, if you have it short, you say most of the time it's 30 days, and then you have somebody that says, hey, this is Chuck, and I forgot to tell Sharon, I registered five months ago for this class, and now she wants us to be grouped together with Cheryl, who registered when she was supposed to last week. So you could go in, edit this to, uh, what is it, five times 30, 160 days, rerun the list, and then once you leave it, it will go back to the default scope. So again, that uh, if the speed of the registration lookup for grouping is slow, uh, you can certainly uh, fiddle with that number. So I would recommend put it to a fairly low number just because you're getting a lot faster responses. Uh, maybe that's 14 days, 21 days. And if you say, well, I want to register, I want to group it with Chuck. And you say, well, that Chuck is way early, which is unlike me, but anyway. Um, you could change that to 90 days or 120 days, rerun your list um, and, and track that person down. So, all right, what about this issue? Grouping registrations after the fact, lots of them. 
So, um, and especially if you're dealing with uh, registrations that are billings, which actually is probably <clears throat> uh, one of the more common options. You, you, people are from a particular company, a school district, um, one of your businesses that's a big customer, <clears throat> have a lot of students that register and say, bill me. And now the company says, oh yeah, by the way, yeah, we do wanna have all those students from uh, Aceware University uh, bill to the one master account. So what you can do is use the mass tools uh, tool. And under module registrations, mass group, or there's a shortcut, F8 key, and it gives you a little pop-up. Find people by firm, by family, by a given course, and group registrations that have a balance on them. Again, this wouldn't show registrations that are paid off in full. And so then once you pick the, the criteria, firm, family, if you were doing firm, you would then select the firm that you wanted to look at. Uh, now, just a side note, the family. What What is the family option in the grouping? Well, the family option shows you uh, the name grouping names that a name record might have affiliated if you're using name grouping. So again, that is something that uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, you can use if, especially if you've got like family members. You're doing a group and you got uh, students. I, I guess ex, uh, an after the fact for students may not be, may not be particularly common. All right, so um, it, let's go back to the firm. So if, if we had chosen ACEWARE systems, we now would get a list of all of the registrations from ACEWARE systems employees or that are connected to the firm ACEWARE systems that have a balance due. And got a lot of deadbeats at ACEWARE here. So, so again, what you would do then is just check the people that you wanted to include in the box you can deselect all, select all. I think by default, they are not selected. And uh, this example shows after someone would have clicked the select all option. Um, and that would then allow you to group them all together. So uh, what's the next problem? Well, I've got a group, I love groups, but now we've got somebody who wants to be out of this group. And, um, you know, uh, Matthew says, hey, you know, I, this is one, I, I don't want to be part of this group. I'm antisocial today. I don't want to be part of this group. So what do we do when we need to get out of a, regist uh, a single registration out of that group? Or even if it's a, a company group and you've, you've maybe got a group that you've paid for, uh, but now one of the members of that company says, I can't come to the workshop. I need a refund. Well, what you have to do is that you have to ungroup the registration before you can do a refund. So again, you can't use a refund wizard for group registrations. Um, so once you do that, then you're able to go into the individual registration and, and do the standard uh, refund wizard approach. So we're actually uh, going along pretty good here. Um, so I will uh, ask if there's questions here. Sharon, you want anything to deal with right now or you want to address that a little bit later? Let's address that later. All right, we have a question. We'll get back to that in a bit. So Laura Lee, if you hang on a bit. Uh, what about these darn students that keep changing their minds? Okay, well, transfers. Now, cancellations is, uh, you know, we can, we can deal with cancellations, but transfers, there are, three main modes of transfers from a single individual, uh, single individual registration. Uh, with that, uh, you can transfer that registration to another person. You can transfer an in, a, 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 the person who's in that registration to another course. Uh, from the main menu course module, there is actually an option to mass transfer everyone from one course to another course. And within payments, which is really, I guess, not a course transfer, not a registration transfer, but a payment transfer, uh, there are options to be able to transfer payments 
to escrow or to another registration. So let's do the first one, transfers from a registration. You go to the registration, click on transfer, you get the option, transfer to a student, to a class, uh, and some notes about groups. If you have a grouped registration, the reg transfer button on the group registration only allows you to transfer an owner of the registration that you were on to a different person so that the registration in that group stays uh, where it is so the money is the same on that particular group but you can swap the person inside that registration if you want to transfer a student in a group registration to another course and I suppose this would be if I have a husband wife and both of us were going to be registered in dance and uh, one of the partners says oh I that date doesn't work for me you can go dance by yourself but I want to transfer to the macrame class or to the bass fishing class if you want to transfer a registration as part of a group to a different class you do have to ungroup that registration and again folks if you are uh, ask if you got questions about grouping, you know, pop them in the chat box. Transfers from a registration. Once you do a registration transfer to to another uh, register uh, to another registration, if you're transferring from one person, a student, one student to the other student, uh, this doesn't pop up because there's no money involved. The existing registration with the payments and the fees stay exactly the way they are. But if you're transferring to a, actually I take that back, uh, I guess you do get this option when you're doing uh, uh, from person to person, is that it does ask you if you wanna do any transfer charge holdback. I forgot about that because if, if you have a policy that you allow transfers but you wanna hold a $10 holdback charge, uh, you will get this transfer option uh, item. Uh, you can choose to actually keep a copy of the original registration. So it kind of, it keeps a copy of the original registration, cancels it if you, for some reason, want to keep an audit trail of how many times Joe Blow transfers from one class to the other. Although you'll note that there is a note down here, which you can edit as part of the process. You can actually change the, uh, you can edit that and that will be written to the registration note uh, on the individual. Um, again, additional fees. Uh, if there were additional charges on one registration, uh, it does not automatically carry those additional charge links over additional fees or adjustments. It doesn't bring those along to the new registration. So if you did want to keep any discounts or add-on fees when you're moving from person to person or if you would charge uh, registration to registration for instance a parking fee you might have on registration whether does that apply to the new course if they're transferring to a different course so again you you have the option to determine how to manage additional fees attendance records uh, registration user defined data fields do you want those brought along um, now, what about this one? And again, the, the poor feline here. What if I have to transfer everybody from one class to another? I might have a class that's a weak sister, it doesn't have the minimum number, and I wanna move everybody to a different section. Well, there is an option uh, called mass transfers under the main menu module course. And what that allows you to do is to pick the starting course, uh, the target course, and it will then move all of the registrations and the payments associated, well, it should move selected registrations and the payments associated with that to the new class. And again, you it isn't 100%. You actually will get a class roster view with checkboxes. So if there was a reason why you only wanted to transfer some students, or typically you might call these four students and say, Mary Jo and Susie and Curly, Curly Mo, uh, do you want to transfer to this other section? And three of them say yes, and the fourth one says, no, nah, it doesn't work, uh, put my money in escrow. So you could pick the students to transfer and move them over into the new class. 
which I think would be pretty handy. Um, and again, if the individuals from the first course are enrolled in a second course, um, their registrations will be excluded. So in other words, it'll, they'll, that registration wouldn't be transferred uh, because of course we don't allow multiple enrollments for the same person in the same class. Duplicate registration is bad. Uh, transfers of money, and we talk about the student who needs to transfer money, and and uh, this is a, a topic that really has uh, all kinds of nuances of how to do that. But uh, when you open a payment for record for a single individual, you have a transfer payment or transfer to escrow option uh, on that particular payment that you can process. And again, that's a wizard that pretty much operates through the process. Well, what if my company wants a special bill uh, and it's a contract course uh, and I have one company rep who's paying for it that may not be enrolling in the course? Well, what you have to do is set up the contract person, the contact person uh, is has to be in your names database. So if you have um, Stacia Payne is a training director for XYZ school, uh, you'd have to make sure Stacia has a record in the database and then register that person in the course. You'd put all the fees to that one registration, uh, mark it as a billing record, and then you could have a name in with that course with the fees that you can create an invoice for or collect the payment for if they want to pay on the spot with the credit card. When you've done that, then you can enroll all the employees into that course with a zero fee option. So basically, uh, if Chuck Havlicek is, is going to be handling a billing record for this customer training, I'm moonlighting as an HR director for ACME. Uh, so you'd register, make sure he's in the names database, enroll him in the course, mark this as the billing record, and then you would assign to that registration the contract price. And then you would enroll any students into that course as a fee, typically company paid. Now, there are nuances that you can use on this. If, for instance, you said, well, it's a contract price, but maybe individual employees might want to buy an optional lunch and the, the employee has to pay for their own lunch. You could add a adjustment fee, an add-on fee to the individual employees on that. But basically, the idea is that uh, the tuition would be paid for by that person who's the billing record. Um, again, to kind of keep people awake, I'm going to ask, raise your hand if you have been doing any uh, billing only records. In other words, where you've been setting up a record on a class and all the bill goes to that person uh, using that billing record option. Uh, we've got Oklahoma. Not one, one, anybody else. Cody, not use it. I would, well, whether or not you might use that over there. But anyway, that is uh, that is a handy tool as far as. Uh, basically kind of third party, third party uh, billing. I always joked about uh, that it's like you're, uh, you're going to dinner with a group of people and you're going to um, pick up the check and sit down to dinner with them, but you're not going to be able to eat any food because all you're there for is to pick up the check. Uh, so again, um, that's kind of an analogy. The other thing is that if a person who is actually taking the class is going to be picking up the bill, then actually you don't, you would not mark them as a billing record because a billing record registration is usually not, well, you know, is historically it is by default not included in the roster view. So uh, typically, uh, I guess if you've got uh, Chuck Havlicek is going to attend that ACME training along with uh, the employees of ACME cleaning, uh, you just put him in as a regular registrant, change his fee to contract price, but then you could go ahead and put 
uh, the other employees at that zero fee. So again, you got nuances of being able to handle that. Um, the invoice for a uh, contract course where uh, this was that customer service uh, example where I was the billing only record. Uh, again, I didn't, my name doesn't show on the list. My name doesn't show on the list of registrants, but that um, the bill is going to me or my, my company uh, contact on that. Okay, here's another challenge, a problem. Class is full, but the student wants on a wait list. Well, um, there are of course many ways to add people to the wait list. I keep clicking, sorry about that. Um, allow Ace Web users to add themselves to a wait list, purge wait list, and transfer wait list. So uh, the normal process of course is that wait listed registrations are actually a registration, it'll show up in the green registration screen, but again, because it's marked as wait list, they are not counted as enrollments, and uh, you can view the list of waitlisted people from the quick report on the course screen. Um, and again, uh, by default, uh, waitlisted students don't appear on rosters, uh, although most of the printing setup screens do offer an option to show a um, show a roster or show a uh, show the waitlist to people on the roster. Uh, and again, uh, by default, waitlisted registrations cannot be grouped. Uh, now we did make an exception to this, or we do have a preference though that you can go into edit preferences register to allow to group waitlisting. Uh, I forget we had a couple customers who wanted to have that and so we we added that as a feature. Waitlisted registrations again aren't included are not included on printed receipts and by default they're not included on email receipts but again there is a uh, uh, I think the allow waitlisting under preferences will then include them on an email receipt. So again, all right, waitlisting uh, on ACEWeb. Some notes on ACEWeb. Uh, students cannot pay for a waitlisted registration online. Student can cancel a waitlisted registration from the registration history. And again, the idea of a waitlisted registration because it doesn't really exist uh, you can only apply a payment to a quote real registration. So, uh, but a student can, if they have a waitlisted registration on their um, history file or on their upcoming course file, uh, they can cancel that, uh, if you would, their spot in the waitlist, uh, which would be, I think, a nice thing for the student to do. This is something I actually what really didn't know happened, but that in ACEWeb, it counts enrolled and waitlisted people when determining if a course is full. So again, uh, I think the idea here, and this has been the way it has been forever, is that if you've got a class with waitlisted people and you cancel a registration out of that, uh, the, the, the enrolled group, that you should try to contact your waitlist first to see if they can get in rather than letting somebody off the street come in and take that uh, canceled spot uh, in the course. So again, that is something in the, in the waitlist notes. And on ACEWeb, ACEWeb enabled or disabled uh, capability to waitlist for a course, you set that up in Student Manager where you can turn on uh, or turn off, I think by default uh, the option is on, to allow waitlisting for this course on ACEWeb. So again, that is a, uh, that is a system level uh, or a course by course level preference uh, that, that you control. Okay, um, want to get rid of waitlists. Now again, uh, obviously, I would think that you'd want to keep wait lists on file for a year or so to see if uh, you've got a class that comes up every spring and there was wait lists for it and you'd want to keep that wait list around at least maybe till the next time the course is offered 
to try to say, hey, Chuck, uh, you, we saw you were waitlisted for last spring's uh, Easter basket class. We have another section coming up. You want to you want to enroll. And so uh, but after a certain amount of time, waitlisted uh, class information gets really pretty stale, kind of like fish and company, you know, after three days, no, after X number of a couple years, perhaps. So there is an option under the module courses mass change update tool, which you should be familiar with, especially if you're a keeper of the flame. Um, there is an option to purge wait lists. So you basically can leave all of this above unchanged, go in and put in a range of dates here for uh, old courses that you want to get rid of the old wait list and hit the purge number and it'll automatically clean up all of those all of those um, old wait lists. And again, if somebody has an argument about keeping or not keeping on that and uh, wants to make a suggestion on that, chat that in the list. So transferring wait lists. Again, uh, if you are just so dang lucky that you've got uh, classes that are full all over the, the base and you've got a You've got one class, I'm not quite sure how you do this, but uh, if there was a reason you wanted to transfer a wait list from one course to another course, you can use that uh, mass registration transfer tool we talked about a minute ago, where you'd enter the starting course or the class that you want to transfer out of, the class that you want to transfer into, and then you'd check the box that says, only transfer waitlisted registrations. Okay, so now what the problem? Now what the problem? Well, I want to support a membership program, so I would like to be able to help memberships. So um, let's go ahead and um, and again, I want to, Laurel, I I think uh, we're going to hit that. We're going to jump to AceWeb. We'll have time for some examples, and we'll get to AceWeb. We got a question about what. Uh, enrolling others looks like on ACE web. So I want to support a membership program and create membership courses, be able to set expiration dates or expiration um, models. I want to track membership renewals. I want to support tiered memberships like bronze, silver, and gold, different levels of membership in a course, supporting family memberships, and restrict membership a restrict enrollment in certain courses to current members only. Uh, and I need to be able to report retention tracking for memberships. Now, again, if you are an OLLI program and OSHA lifelong learning, you should know all about memberships. But if you're a school uh, customer who has never done a member program, but you say, you know, we wanna explore putting together a member program, uh, this little bit uh, the next few minutes, I'll kind of give you an overview. I will reference for you that there is, and I am going to jump to uh, the web here and get to aceware.com. Uh, in the uh, webinar archive, we've got a link on membership, or there are, uh, there's a couple of webinars Managing membership courses. There is a course on a uh, course, a webinar on managing membership courses. So, for more detail on that, I would point you to uh, both the online help guide and the webinar archive. But again, so like I said, we're going to kind of go through a, a quick review. So, uh, when you set up a membership course uh, and you enroll a student into that course, the student automatically gets a membership assigned to them. And where that occurs is on the demographic tab of the name record, there is a memberships box and it would have a membership code and an expiration date. Now, from the student record, you can actually go to a student record directly, go to the membership, uh, or go to the demographics tab, click on the label, just the word memberships, and it'll pop up a list of memberships that you might have set up within your system. You click an X on the uh, column that you want the member to, you want to put a membership on. 
uh, indicate an expiration date, and then do Control F4 to save this to the name record. And, and so you can actually gift a membership or manually put a membership on a record. And we have actually had a couple customers who use the membership tracking tool to track participation in a certificate program. Uh, if there are some particular reasons that that might be a, a better way or a handy way to track certificate participation. Um, when you have a membership already established on an individual, if you right mouse click on the date of that membership code, you can actually edit the expiration date. So again, you can control and manage the expiration date. Um, and there's a track when a person's enrolled in the next term, the renewed member is checked so they can they can track renewals. Um, tiered memberships, again, in uh, setting up the fees, once you set up a membership type course, uh, when you assign fees to the course is where you'd put in uh, the membership expiration model, uh, whether you do it on an explicit date, like an annual membership where it expires on the end of the year, or you could use a rolling membership. In other words, you buy a one-year membership and it would be good for 365 days. Um, the other thing you can do is cr assign a member code that would tie to, and I don't have a good example here, I should have used these, uh, you would have membership categories, gold, silver, bronze, and then uh, so that you could actually have different fee levels for the different memberships and have different discounts or benefits that these different members would get uh, by setting up those fees on the course level. Um, all right, tiered memberships. Uh, family memberships. Uh, one of the things that we support with the membership tool is a family membership. So the idea is that I can buy a family membership and then have several people of my family be able to be eligible for the for the membership discounts. And where that family identifier comes from is in the name group that when you are on the name record and you click on that little name group checkbox, it'll bring up the list of uh, names that happen to be in my group. I've got the extended Aceware family as part of my as part of my family membership. And again, uh, if you haven't used name grouping, that is a handy tool, especially if you're doing uh, kids or um, family type enrollments. Uh, to just be able to track, you know, which family members are part of the Havlicek household. And you need to be, you know, Charles and my wife, Barbara, and my daughter, Christina, and my daughter, uh, Becky, and who, what other family members that I want to say that is part of my immediate family. Member-only classes. And again, OSHA Lifelong Learning, OLLI programs, to a lot of times say that you must be a member in order to take this class. Uh, and again, uh, that's a way for you as a program, if you wanted to restrict access to certain courses to certain subgroups, it wouldn't have to be a paid membership even. You could create a membership course, give memberships to certain people, and restrict access to a class that you have to be a member of the ACE Club in order to even enroll in this particular class. And then the membership retention reporting, which is part of the uh, part of the um, reporting side of memberships. Okay, so here we are. I want to encourage my students to enroll others in our classes. And now we're getting, I think, to Laurelay's Lai's question. So what you do is make sure that you have enabled the proxy registration on AceWeb. And again, I'm plugging our conference. Sharon was doing that at the start. Coming up next month, uh, be there or be square. Gonna have a great set of programs, but maybe I want to enroll uh, somebody in my organization to that. And so what happens on that is that when you log in to your record and you hit enroll others, you would get a list of all of the people that you have previously enrolled, uh, where I would have done a proxy registration somewhere in history, enter the address of a different person I want to enroll, or if I have a family group 
Uh, I showed you my Aceware family group from my name side. You, the, they would see that particular set of, of names as well. Um, now, the, the, there is a multi-proxy option that lets you pick multiple people to enroll from their firm or from my select list. So let's see, the standard option. So when the standard option is, 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 is being used, you basically click one of the people on the list that you want to enroll. It would then drop them in the enrollment cart, uh, allow you to add a fee to that, and then continue to do the add another person or um, add another uh, uh, person to the class. So if you have the new option, which is multi-proxy registration option, it allows you to enroll multiple people in one class at the same time. Uh, so that I, I would, this is a, free it's free option isn't it Sharon I don't think there's a charge for this um, charge for what uh, it, it is free what is free <laughs> proxy registration the, the oh yes multi yes proxy, yes multi absolutely multi proxy mm -hmm. all right there we go uh, so again uh, I would encourage you to do that I think that would be a great uh, way to get again multiple registrations and it's a lot easier for your student without having to go back and cycle through the you know enroll somebody else option so they enroll multiple people at a time in one course there is also an option and again don't know how many people use this norm this would be when you get going this is something you'd use is that they you can mark on a name record that this student is allowed to proxy register anybody from their firm on aceweb so when you do that and that person logs in and says enroll somebody else, the enroll somebody else option allows them to either choose work contacts or personal contacts. So again, work contacts would be every name that is associated with the same firm Charles Havlicek is with. Personal contacts would be those people in my uh, group, my family group, if you would. And again, they can enroll uh, multiple they could enroll, if you have the multi-proxy, they could enroll all eight of these, nine, all of the ACEWARE people in this one class. So again, speeds up speeds up the process. So um, now I would back to the question. Now, in addition to the option of uh, picking from the list of, by your firm or personal contacts or people whom you have previously registered as enroll somebody else, you are presented with an option to enter the email address of the person that you want to add uh, as an enrollee to this class. And if that person's email is in the database, uh, it will present it to you to say, this email belongs to Sharon Brookshire. Is this who you want to register? and you say yes or no. So you're not able to uh, you know, snoop into personal data for somebody that you don't actually have a connection to, but you can identify if they're in the database and uh, say, yeah, that's Sharon. Yeah, that's Sharon Brookshire. I'll, I wanna register into this class. Uh, and then finally, there is an option to actually enroll a brand new person where you can actually fill in a brand new um, uh, I mean, a completely new name record uh, and enroll them in the class. So uh, again, the proxy registration gives you really some, some nice options for multiple registrations. Um, multi-proxy, again, if you have multiple proxies selected and you pick two or more, supplemental data capture pages are not, um, are not uh, supported. Uh, it will only load if one proxy is selected. In other words, you just pick one person out of your list, not two or three. Uh, if multiple proxies are selected, in other words, I'm picking all eight of my people from Aceware, and I have a workshop class, it will support workshops, but everybody who I am enrolling in this conference workshop would be enrolled in the same set of workshops. So you can't 
change Sharon's workshops to from Jason's or Matthew's on that. And again, proxy options are controlled by AceWeb I and I. Uh, you can either look it up in the help in the help guide or call your tech. Um, all right, so I want to finish up here and then we'll try to get back to some examples. Um, wanted to make a pitch for the PEP, the Couples or Partner Enrollment Program. Uh, if you want to have a way to promote getting multiple people in courses, this is a great way to do it. And what it allows you to do is to create a fee for the class that would be a partner fee, a couple fee, and again, you can use whatever verbiage you want because uh, you set what is a keyword that determines this is a special course. Offer a bit of a discount. In this case, I got a pretty big discount. You got 20, 25% off discount if you bring a partner. Um, but the beauty of this is, is that when you select couples fee, uh, AceWeb will then present the note down here, save to cart and select your partner. And again, this is similar to a proxy reg in that said select a family member or someone you have previously enrolled and you type in the name or you type in the email address of the person you want to include. And again, so the point is the student has to pick a second person to be in this class with them. And again, that person who is doing the enrollment pays for the fee for that. They will pay for the, the fee for that. And again, uh, for, for marketing folks, if you want to encourage multiple enrollments in classes, and again, any class, not you know, dance or couples massage, uh, you can use it to promote. You could call it bring a friend, uh, bring a buddy, find a friend, choose a colleague, um, you know, pick a partner. Uh, so that again, you can put that uh, partner fee on any course in the system that uh, would be um, other than, I don't know what, how to be a hermit, I suppose. You probably wouldn't do that on the how to be a hermit class. But uh, again, great way to promote the program. Billings, third parties. Um, there's multiple ways that you can handle billings. Uh, individual, the firm, a different firm, a different person, or build a new third party. So again, by default, if the firm is connected to a name, is when you go to billing, that's the default billee, the person who's get the bill. If no firm is entered, then the student's name and address themselves is entered. Uh, however, you got options. If the bill was, uh, if the person had a firm, but they want to change it to the individual, they can click build the individual. If it's an individual and they want to bill it to a firm, uh, if you change back and forth. If you want to find a different firm to bill, if you have an agency that is picking up the tab and you've entered the agency in the firm's table, the um, employment division of the such and such county, uh, you can find them in the firm's table. Uh, or go to another person. If you have Sugar Daddy Warbucks, that's picking up the picking up the bill for registrations. You can bill them to that individual. And by the way, this is staff, you know. <laughs> uh, people on the web aren't able to do this. Uh, or you could put in a third party name where you type in a new address and then that is saved as the person who's gonna get the bill for that. Uh, don't forget payment plan. Uh, you can indicate if you have, uh, uh, you want to allow a person to pay off a large bill over multiple uh, billings, uh, you can use the payment plan option. Okay, here we go. I got a student who wants to change your payment or wants a refund. So, voiding and refunding, voiding, refunding payments. Uh, you can update payer information uh, on a payment. PO number, pay info, but you cannot change a payment amount for a payment that has already been uh, re uh, invoiced or, or uh, receipted. What you can do then is void that payment, create a new record to add the correct amount, I guess, or in the case of invoices, there is the, and, and I think uh, uh, who would, uh, correct me on this to make sure that you could use the reinvigorate invoice to actually create a new invoice number. 
Uh, deleting payments. You can delete a payment if the payment has not been assigned a receipt number or invoice number. But again, normally, uh, again, actually, um, I should say can, you may delete a payment because uh, you actually can delete a payment that has a receipt. We recommend for purposes of audit trail that you don't delete payments with an invoice or a receipt number because uh, you lose the, the audit trail. If that's not a concern for you, I guess you can delete it. Uh, but the proper way to do that for audit trail is to void that payment. Uh, voiding a single payment, enter the payment type, enter the reason for the void, and then you can go in and create the new payment record or the corrected payment record. To void all payments, now this is if you have a billing that might have a bunch of people in it and the company says, hey, we got bought out by XYZ company and they're not gonna, they're not gonna want us to go to this course anymore. So you've gotta void a whole bunch of payments. You can actually go into tools, financial, void invoice receipt and type in the invoice or receipt number, reason for voiding, it'll give you a preview of all the payments to be voided and you can then, um, you can preview those and when you're ready, you say, yep, those are the ones we need to void, click continue and it'll void the entire group of payments. Uh, all pending, and so again, pay record that came in from the web that's marked pending. Um, so we're gonna talk about a couple ways to manage that. Why are there pendings? And again, basically, if the user at the checkout level closes the browser uh, before notification that, uh, or that the notification from your payment system is not sent back to AceWeb, the payment is usually saved, uh, marked pending, and marked as voided. And again, you can set within AceWeb how those records are saved. Uh, typically, we recommend that the default behavior would be that you'd have a payment recorded, saved, and marked void, and that you'd have a registration saved, it would be marked all pending, and marked canceled. So what do we do about that? Well, under uh, your preferences, you can go into the registration preferences and say, show pending payments at startup. Now, when you do that, it'll bring up the payments that are showing as pending, and you can then you know, go back and deal with them later, typically by going to the pay grabber, the F7 tool, where again, if you hit the payments flagged as AW pending uh, and just hit the OK button, it'll bring up the list of payments that are pending, so you can then deal with those. Now, after when you when you've got pay grabber you've got the option to be able to say auto clear pending with no balances which can happen if they to have two or three pendings and there's no payment balance and that's that you might as well get rid of those but you can then view the list of pendings as you're processing to see well which which registrations went through and which ones did not we say well uh the the thousand dollar payment for this particular class went through and the uh, $230 payment for Terry Scott went through. So we wanna mark those as good and we would like to unmark the pending, which was that we're gonna turn those into good payments. And then after that, it'll ask you if you wanna clear the remaining pendings, the ones that didn't get processed because you've checked those, payment never gave through on that. I just wanna get rid of those. All right, finally, getting close to the wrap up. Good news, bad news. Got 20 registrations, they sent them in on a spreadsheet. Well, we got a, we got a solution for that. Uh, you can import them via Excel. If it's for a specific class, you can use the speed entry registration, registration module or the shortcut Alt-Z, click on import wizard, and it will let you get to the import, or if you've got a list of, of uh, registrations for multiple classes, you can use the registration import from tools import export. 
So from a single class, you would go to the class, set up the fee, set up the hours, whatever the default grade is, hit the import wizard, locate the file that you want to have to import. It'll you match up the columns in the file to the data fields in the register table or the names table, and then those will go into your registration record. From the master area, if you wanted to enroll multiple people in multiple classes or one person in multiple classes, that is from the tools import export side. The big takeaways on this is that the import file must include the course code field and uh, data about the name, first, last, and an email. There is a sample Excel import file template available in resources. Hang on guys, we're just about to the end here. Importing registrations from tools, um, there's more detail in the SM help. Uh, again, quick notes, the course number must exist. Imported names can be matched to existing by email or name ID, text data format, and again, that sample import file. So here we go. Hopefully you got solutions to these. So we're gonna get the questions. Sharon, I think we've been pretty darn quiet on questions. They've been pretty quiet, but there is a question about uh, looking things up. You're able to look up an invoice, but can you look up receipts like you do for invoices in the report menu? Uh, you should be able to do that in terms of the, the F7 key, pay grabber. Pay grabber allows you to type in an invoice number. So yes, uh, invoice number is, um, is one of the tools using that F7 key. So again, absolutely a good one. And again, the slideshow will be available for download from the ACE Web uh, webinar. Uh, from the ACE Web webinar um, archive in a, in a day or two. Um, did want to get to the question about uh, web enrollment uh, as far as online registration. So if I'm, the, the question was how does, how does ProxyReg work on ACE Web? I'm gonna go ahead and log on and register somebody else in a class. And again, um, by way of uh, reporting. So I want to go to a course, and I want to take an aviation class, and I want to enroll somebody else. So when I enroll somebody else, I have lots of options here. So these are people that I'm connected with for work because I have the permission to show my work contacts. If I did personal contacts, what this would be are all the people that are connected to me via my name contact side, which incidentally, if we hadn't talked about that, is the grouping, the grouping link uh, that you have on the name record. Or uh, these are names that I have registered through other proxy registration. But then this is the spot that if I wanted to do uh, Sharon, at Aceware, and she's in the database. Never mind that she's never mind that she's already in there. There is one record, Sharon Brookshire. Is that who I want? Or if she's not in the database, or I said, well, wait a minute, it was uh, the person I want is Sharon uh, Brown. So I would go in, create a new name record. So again, from the web, you can actually create a brand new record as well as enrolling um, an existing record. So, well, I believe, um, do we have anything else possibly that we need to cover, uh, Sharon? We're a couple minutes over. Appreciate folks sticking with us. Yeah, I'll thanks for hanging up, in there. Thanks for hanging in there with us, everyone. We'll have the recording and the PowerPoint slides in the webinar archives ready for you tomorrow. And last, you know, time is running out. Let's get your registration in for conference. We'd love to see uh, you there. Let's practice that <laughs> registration and enroll yourself and a couple of your colleagues. So Yes, and I did right. type in a few sessions that there will go into more detail during conference. So great to see you all today. Have a fantastic weekend, and we hope we'll see you in June. 
All right. Bye. Bye, everybody.